Hello everyone, Luke Stein here, and this is going to be a very short introduction to the basics and key concepts around bond and stock valuation. So our key valuation technique is going to be a set of tools called Discounted Cash Flow Analysis, or DCF. And this is a, a toolkit that we're going to be able to use to value pretty much any project, asset, or firm. So here we're going to be introducing DCF in order to value two specific types of financial assets, bonds, or debt assets, and stocks, or traded equity. The idea behind DCF in general which is going to be our key valuation technique, although not the only valuation uh, tool that we'll introduce, is that you can calculate the fair price as the present value of all of the future cash flows associated with a project, asset, or firm. Basically what that means is we're going to use our simple time value of money tools, in particular the technique of discounting. We need to know what the future cash flows associated with the investment are, that is to say, all of the payoffs that the investor expects to receive over the life of the project, which, as we'll see in particular with equity valuation, may be indefinite. That equity may last uh, potentially even forever into the future. So the first thing we're going to need to know are those future cash flows, what they are in expectation. And the second thing that we need to know is what the investor's so-called discount rate is. This is the rate of return that we're going to use to discount those future cash flows in order to calculate the present value, which we will uh, interpret as the fair price or fair value of that asset today. And this discount rate is designed to reflect the rate of return that investors expect or require on those assets. More to come about where that discount rate might come from, how we might think about estimating what it should be or empirically what it is. But you can think about that discount rate as generally um taking into account two main things the investor should have in mind. One, the fact that she's impatient. That's the time value of money. She'd rather receive payments in the near term than in the long term, and therefore that discount rate is going to, um, to lower the value of a cash flow if it's expected far off into the future. The second thing that discount rate is going to try to capture is the risk that an investor anticipates taking on. And as we'll have more to say about, the higher the level of risk that the investor expects, the greater the discount rate that she should expect to use when she values the asset. And as we'll see algebraically, that's going to result in lower values that she places on risky assets. So if we think about a timeline view, we can draw all of those expected future cash flows based on when they're expected to arrive in the future. And in this picture, we've shown some of them bigger and some of them smaller, arriving at time one, time two, out through time n into the future, a finite or potentially infinite life of the investment. And then by discounting those future cash flows, we can try to estimate what the fair price or present value of the asset is today. And if you look at the direction of the arrows that I've drawn in this timeline, this investment project as will be typical for most bonds and stocks, has all positive cash flows in the future. So an investor who owns a bond or a stock expects to receive future payments, and we show that with upward pointing arrows uh, on the timeline diagram, and therefore she expects to have to pay for the investment today, which is why we have, uh, have drawn that fair price or present value using a downward pointing arrow. This DCF technique is going to involve modeling relevant cash flows and as I mentioned, in this section, we're going to be doing that for two types of assets, bonds and equity, although we can also use DCF to try to value projects that a firm might consider investing in or firms as a whole, not just the financial securities like bonds or equity issued by those firms, but the entire firm as a going concern. On the bond side, the key cash flows that an investor should expect to receive, assuming the investor holds that bond all the way until the end of its lifetime, and assuming that the firm actually makes all of the promised payments are two kinds. The first one that we call coupons. And those are the payments that the investor receives along the way. Typically for corporate debt, investors are going to receive coupon payments uh, every six months or twice a year. We call those semi-annual bonds. In addition, when the bond matures or expires, the investor should expect to be able to receive some final payoff. And we typically call that the face value or the par value of the bond. One way to think about these payoffs um, is that, or these cash flows, is that when an investor buys a corporate bond uh, or a government-issued bond, what she's making is something a little bit like an interest-only loan. 
the coupon payments reflect the interest that she receives along the way for having lent that money initially, and the final value, face value or par value, that final payoff, represents the repayment of principal, all of which happens at the end. That means that the pattern of cash flows can be thought of as two main kinds, an annuity associated with the coupons. Recall that an annuity is a series of equally spaced, equal cash flows received over time. And since those coupons on most bonds are going to be equal to each other and received at equally spaced intervals, say every six months or twice a year, they represent an annuity whose life is as long as the life of the bond. When we put those things into a financial calculator or Excel, we're going to include those coupon payments as PMTs or payments. Um, those are uh, the, the periodic payments that arrive once per period over the life of the annuity. In addition, that final payoff, face or par value, which the investor receives at the end of the bond, is going to be included as the FV or future value, conveniently enough also the FV or face value of the bond, and we're going to enter it in that FV field either in a financial calculator or as an argument associated with the FV or future value in the PV or present value function in Excel. A little bit confusingly, PV here is distinctly not the par value uh, of the bond, it's the present value of the bond. You can also use the NPV function in Excel or the net present value function in Excel. This is an alternative way of trying to calculate bond values uh, numerically. The only thing is that it would require you to enter every individual cash flow, one after the other, in the timeline, say, in Excel. What's convenient about the PV function is you can just use the argument n or number of periods to tell Excel or your financial calculator how many of those coupon or annuity payments they're going to be and then enter the amount of them just one time as the PMT or payment. If you want to use the NPV function, it provides some additional flexibility, but we don't really need it here for basic bond pricing. Um, and since all the payments are equal, uh, it can sometimes be easier not to use the NPV function and have to enter every single one of those payments one by one one after another. On equity valuation, we can think about the associated cash flows for a stockholder as being the dividends that the company pays. So these are cash disbursements made by a firm to its owner, and we call those dividends. Now, you may recall that when I described the cash flows received by a bondholder that would feed into DCF, I made the assumption that the bondholder held the bond all the way until maturity. Therefore, she received the coupons and the final payoff. Well, the life of an equity is potentially infinite. So if we make the analogous assumption about an equity holder, what we have to have in mind is she's going to receive dividends as cash flows, but that would involve, at least in theory, holding that equity or stock all the way until it, you know, the end of the universe. Um, when we get into some more details on equity valuation, we'll, we'll think about what happens if we relax that assumption, in which case an investor might not only receive dividends while she holds the equity, but she might also receive what we call sales proceeds that might be associated with a capital gain when she sells the thing at some time in the future, some finite uh, holding period, even if the life of the equity itself is not necessarily finite. In order to value equities using DCF, we need to make some assumption about that pattern of future dividends. The simplest possible set of assumptions that we could make is that those dividends are going to grow at some constant rate forever. And in fact, the simplest constant growth rate at which those dividends could grow would be zero, meaning there's a conf uh, constant dividend paid regularly forever um, uh, for the whole life of the equity, which could potentially um, uh, never end. So if we assume constant growth in dividends, um, and then we discount that constantly growing stream of dividends, we're going to get what's sometimes called a growing perpetuity. It's like an annuity, except that it lasts forever, and we call annuities that last forever perpetuities. But because the payments are not potentially not equal, they're growing at some constant rate. We call this a growing perpetuity. And it turns out that we're going to have an easy-to-implement formula that we can use. Not a built-in Excel function, but a very easy formula that we can use in order to solve the val for the value of uh, the discounted value of a growing perpetuity. A potentially more complicated, but arguably more realistic set of assumptions is that the dividends associated with an equity may not grow at some constant rate. We may anticipate that business conditions or economic conditions are not likely to remain constant forever. And so if we want to apply a non-constant growth model to value equities, typically what we'll do is we'll forecast dividend payments for the next let's say five to six years, associated with our understanding of the firm itself, the market environment, um, the general economic environment. And then we'll make an assumption about what the growth rate is for dividends from the end of our forecast period, let's say five to six years in the future, 
all the way out into the future um, infinitely from there. So we're going to assume some fundamentals-based dividend forecast for the short term, and then a constant perpetuity uh, growth after that. And when we um, when we do those kinds of models, we can use the growing perpetuity formula um, to get the the um, as described in the constant growth model to get what's called a terminal value, the value of the equity um, as of the time when dividends start growing at a constant rate forever at the end of the forecast period, and then combine that with our short-term dividend forecast using the NPV or net present value function in Excel. And as I mentioned, we could also use these DCF type tools in order to value projects where we would discount the free cash flows associated with those projects or to value firms as a whole where we'd think about discounting all of the free cash flows that the firm ever kicks off. More to come on those topics in the future. So a quick overview of the difference between bonds and stocks. And necessarily, this is going to be a very high-level discussion that's going to sweep under the rug uh, a lot of complexity, both about the difference between bonds and stocks, but also about the rich range of different types of financial assets that exist and the different types of uh, of securities that firms might issue in order to raise capital, uh, which include a bunch of stuff other than just the simplest possible bond and stock types. But these capture uh, some ideas about archetypes and provide a useful framework for thinking about what that, that richer set uh, of financial securities might look like. So if we think about bonds, bonds are characterized by capital provision that provides no ownership interest in the firm. So bondholders' relationship with the firm is more like a pure financial investment. There's no control rights. There's no ability to exercise ex post control over how the firm operates. Once you've bought a firm's bonds, you basically have um, a claim on, on the promised coupon payments and the face value or par value that comes at the end, and not too much else typically to say about what goes on. Uh, with the firm. And that claim is going to be a fixed claim. The, the size of the coupon payments and the size of the par value or face value are typically specified right there on the contract, the legal contract that defines the bond. So when you buy the thing, you know what payments to expect, you know how long they're likely to last, um, and unless the firm enters into some kind of default and fails to make promised payments, you're unlikely to do worse and certainly uh, virtually impossible that you would do better than expected. Those payments, as described earlier, are typically going to be coupons, usually twice a year for corporate bonds in the United States, and then that par value or face value that comes at the end. In contrast, stock owners are capital providers who have an ownership interest in the firm. And when you buy stock, you acquire that ownership interest, uh, whether you buy the stock directly from the company or whether you buy the stock from someone who bought it from someone who bought it from someone who bought it from someone who ultimately bought it from the company. Um, stock owners have what's sometimes called a residual claim on the cash flows of the firm. That means that those dividend payments that we described are not guaranteed. There's not a legal obligation of the firm to pay dividends to its shareholders. Assume things go well operationally, if there's money left over after workers have been paid, after suppliers have been paid, after taxes have been paid, and after debt holders have been paid, there may be money left over, and we call that net income or profit, some but not all of which can be paid as dividends to the shareholders. In fact, there are two and only two things that a firm can do with its net income or profits. Either it can pay them out to dividends as dividends to shareholders, or it can reinvest that money in the firm. And shareholders may be very happy to have management do that because reinvestment in the firm, which is going to show up on the balance sheet as an increase in the retained earnings account, can increase the value of the firm in the future, increase the firm's ability to potentially earn profits in the future, and therefore, if all goes well, increase the size of the future dividends that the shareholders might expect to receive. So that means that the lack of guarantee of receiving any particular dividend payment uh, for a shareholder, it comes not only from the fact that all of the revenue of the firm might wind up having to go to pay workers, suppliers, taxes, and debt holders, but also because management may just choose at its discretion not to pay short-term dividends in order, hopefully, to increase the size of potential dividends paid over the long term. So uh, just to summarize, um, debt is going to represent a fixed claim on cash flows, whereas equity represents an uncertain or simply a residual claim on cash flows. Um, debt holders have to get paid before equity holders can get paid out, so they have a higher priority. We sometimes say that debt is senior and equity is junior, although as suggested on the earlier slide, uh, debt holders are not the first ones to get paid. The firm also has to pay its employees, suppliers, taxes, etc. Um, there are differences also in the accounting treatment of debt versus equity. So interest payments uh, made to debt holders are typically tax deductible under the corporate tax code. 
uh, equity um, pay and payment to shareholders or dividends is, is not typically tax deductible for the firm. Debt typically has a finite maturity. So when bonds are issued, um, the investor and the firm know how long they're likely to last. Equity potentially has an infinite life. And there's this big difference in control where debt holders have little, if any, say over the business beyond what's specified in the contract that defines that debt um, when it's initially issued, whereas equity holders have the ability to exercise control over the firm in line uh, with the corporate governance that's set up. So they have a high degree of control and lots of say over the business.